reason we need to understand this book is that this book gets abused in Christian circles today and they make it prove something it doesn't prove. And so we need to understand it well. Uh, the various people that have tried to deal with Galatians, some have gone off one way, some the other way. Some have tried to say, well, it's only talking about the ceremonial law. And in fact, there have been whole books written that that's what it's about. Well, that would be easy if that was true that it's only talking about the ceremonial law, but it's talking about the Ten Commandments as well as the ceremonial law. So that means we do have to understand uh, things a little better. So it's the first time I've, I've done a series on Galatians, but I decided I would like to do that. We don't do it all in a row because you might get tired of it. I don't, I don't know. But about once a month or once every other month, we uh, have one on it. So, uh, this one, I should have put part 11, sorry. Part 11. It's in the middle of the night when I did that. We had studied up to chapter 4, verse 20. And so we'll begin with verse 21 in chapter 4. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? Now here Paul is not using the law in a sense of the Ten Commandments or the ceremonial law particularly, but he's saying basically, don't you know your Old Testament? Have you not read about this story in the Old Testament that was supposed to help you so that you wouldn't make this mistake? Remember, he's trying to <clears throat> trying to uh, straighten out the um, Galatian believers because some of the what we call Judaizers had come over from Jerusalem. And they said, you don't want to listen to Paul. He, he's all mixed up about what the gospel is. And they were teaching that you must be circumcised to be saved and follow the, the ceremonial law. But today, that's been added to by people saying, well, you don't need to follow the Ten Commandments either. And uh, that, you know... We, we learn from Paul very clearly we don't need to follow the ceremonial law, but we are not to cast off the Ten Commandments. Now here is the illustration. You got it in your uh, scripture reading, but we'll read it again. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now this is a wonderful story for many reasons. Sometimes we may be really sad about our mistakes. And I suppose Abraham was sad about the mistake he made to have a child with a servant. But, you know, God uses the mistake to bring a blessing. Isn't that something? We serve a God that's able to do that. Not that we should multiply mistakes, but... He is able, so don't get discouraged. Just seek forgiveness and go on. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman, which would be his wife. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. As you know the story, uh, Sarah was far too old to be able to have children anymore. Now we know from studying the whole life of Abraham, he had no problem uh, helping children to be born because he had quite a few after, afterward when he got a next wife. 
But Sarah was incapable of having a child. So she recommended, you know, you can't always listen to your wife. Sometimes you need to, though. And we're going to see in this story that there was one time God said, you better listen to your wife. But this particular time when she suggested you need to get a younger woman so that you can have the child that God's been talking to you about all this time, which, by the way, was a very long time, at least uh, 25 years plus, and it still hadn't happened. So Abraham thought, you know, it's probably a good idea. So he went ahead. And he had no problem having a child with her. It didn't take a miracle on God's part at all, although every birth is a miracle in a sense, but not the kind of miracle that it was when Sarah gave birth. So that's the contrast that's being drawn here. And it says, which things are an allegory? In other words, they represent something. And then he tells us what they represent. For these Let's see. For these are two covenants. The one from the Mount Sinai. And that one the Bible calls the Old Covenant. So the Old Covenant is represented by the slave woman's birth. That she gave or the birth that she had. Which gendereth to bondage which is Hagar, or the Old Testament says Hagar. So, he said, you know, the Old Covenant leads to bondage. Now, many times Seventh-day Adventists get accused of being uh, living under the Old Covenant because they think that the Ten Commandments were only connected to the Old Covenant. But the Ten Commandments are connected to every covenant in the Bible, and there are three of them. And the Ten Commandments are connected to every one. But when we try it the way of the Old Covenant, it leads to slavery to sin because we can never gain victory over sin. Now the sad part is that there are a lot of Seventh-day Adventists trying to make it to heaven under the old covenant. But, you know, from what I've studied, anybody that's trying that is wasting their time. As it says here, you're going to end up a slave to sin. You're not going to get free of sin. You're going to stay a slave. And you can try your whole lifetime to get ready for heaven under the old covenant, and you'll never make it. And that's what the Jews were doing which he really hits clearly here. Not everyone. There were some that had a different relationship. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. And answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So I said, if you want to get a good look, at those that are trying to make it to heaven under the old covenant represented by Hagar giving birth in the normal way that mothers give birth uh, all you got to do is take a look at Jerusalem and what they're doing and you're going to see a bunch of people in bondage the Bible predicted that they would become a byword among the nations and it was literally true People looked at their religion and the way they practiced it, and they said, those people are crazy. Now, we don't want to follow in their footsteps. We want to learn the lesson that Paul is bringing to our attention here. <coughs> if you wake up, now, the Old Covenant is not entirely bad because some people try it, and they wake up. They say, oh, it's not working. Maybe there's something else. And then they find the new covenant. But if you don't wake up, it's a curse all the way through. 
Notice this uh, in Exodus 19.8. What was it that was wrong with the Old Covenant and why is it a waste of our time to try to follow it? Exodus 19.8. And all the people, this is after God uh, gave his Ten Commandments to the people. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. Sounds like New Year resolutions, doesn't it? <laughs> we come to the beginning of the year and we're tired of doing, uh, you know, wrong in a certain area and we make a resolution we're not going to do that this year. We're going to gain the victory over this. And if we're trying it under the Old Covenant, guess what? The year goes by and we didn't gain the victory over it. So, that's what they did. They thought because they were so used to heathenism, they thought that, well, when God's really on you, you, you better agree with him, because if you don't agree with him, you may be in trouble. So they said that. But one of the commandments said not to worship idols. And within just a short time, they were worshiping an idol. So it, it shows that the Old Covenant just doesn't work. Now, this appears uh, three times in Exodus. Uh, they're, they're a little different setting, but uh, three times. Here in Exodus 24, verse 3, and then verse 7, all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has said will we do. Now, this was when they learned about the uh, all the rest of the laws we call uh, some are the we call them the ceremonial laws uh, but that's not really the proper name for all of them but they are all laws that uh, God gave through Moses then it says in verse 7 and he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience of the people and they said all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient so they promised for the Ten Commandments. They promised for all the other uh, rules that are recorded in the Bible. And they said, don't worry, Lord, we will do it all. But we don't find evidence that that was true. Now let's compare that with the New, the new Covenant. In uh, the text that we will read, I think it's not... We didn't uh, read it yet. But he compares the New Covenant to the New Jerusalem and the Old Covenant to the Jerusalem on earth. So in Hebrews 8.10, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. Notice the Ten Commandments are still there and anything else that hasn't been nailed to the cross. Some things were nailed to the cross. But all of the laws that were not nailed to the cross, which includes the Ten Commandments, God says, I will write it in your heart. So, it's not hard to do something when it has been written in your heart. But it's very hard when you don't want to do it. And you probably won't do it, especially when people are not looking. And you know, God takes a record of everything, whether people are looking or whether it's totally in private, nobody who knows what we're doing. And we can hide from the effects of what we're doing. All of that is recorded. And the only hope we have to be delivered from sin in any form is for God first to write it in our heart. And once he writes it there, it still takes our cooperation and effort uh, joining with Jesus, but now we can do what he asked us to do. And so essentially, Paul is trying to get that across to the Galatians. He said, listen, when I came over there and preached to you, I preach to you how to the only right way to make it to the New Jerusalem. 
But now that these Judaizers have come over, they're getting you back on the uh, Old Covenant program. And you're going to really suffer if you switch back over to the Old Covenant program. So he was trying to wake them up and get them back on the right path. In uh, Galatians 4, verses 26 and 7, it says, But Jerusalem, which is above, is free. So, if you follow the Old Covenant, if you act like they did in Jerusalem, then you're going to be in bondage. But if you uh, enter the New Covenant, then you will be connected with the New Jerusalem up in heaven, which is the mother of us all. Well, we can't say everybody, but all the ones that will be saved, anyway, are connected to the New Jerusalem up in heaven. And then he kind of he kind of hits the Jews in a very tender spot because the Jew believes the only way to heaven is to become a Jew. And if you weren't born a Jew, you better be baptized to be a Jew because you can't go to heaven unless you're a Jew and keep all of these uh, laws that Moses was given as well as the Ten Commandments. For, he says, it is written, now remember he's talking to the Gentiles primarily, for it is written, rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travails not, or travaileth probably, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Now, you have to kind of think about that a little bit. It is a quotation from the Old Testament, which we'll read in a moment. But <clears throat> he considers the Gentiles, by that text, which is correct, he considers them incapable of having children that will go to the New Jerusalem. And he says, this text from the Bible has a very interesting point for you Gentiles. There's going to be more of you in heaven than there is Jews in heaven. Now let's read the one from Isaiah. It comes in uh, chapter 51, verses 1 and 2. It says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said, saith the Lord. Now, uh, the Jews weren't really married to Jesus, but they thought they were, and so he's dealing with it as they think. They think they're married to him. They think they're going to heaven for sure. And he said, guess what? You're going to have less there than what are out in the Gentile world. Now, as a result of all the uh, Gentiles that were to flow into the church, he said, you better enlarge the place of thy tent. Make more room. For the Gentiles to come in and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. In other words, make more room. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Now here is one we could spend quite a bit of time on. But when a church grows, it is a dangerous time if we do not strengthen the stakes. If you keep making a tent bigger and you don't have more stakes or stronger stakes, there's coming a wind that will blow it down. And so here God in the Old Testament is predicting that in the future uh, many, many from the Gentiles are going to pour into the church 
And sad to say, many that were in the church are not going to be ready. And when Jesus comes, they're going to hear the statement, I never knew you. And so he's, he's looking at it from the future. How many children of the Jews will be in the New Jerusalem? How many of the Gentiles will be in Jerusalem? A lot more of them than the Jews. And God forbid that that could be said of Seventh-day Adventists. In uh, Galatians chapter 4, goes on, verse 28 and 9. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. He says to the Gentiles, guess what? You're the ones. If you don't mess up, if you don't follow what the Jews are doing, and you, you do what God can do in your life, or uh, allow him to do what he can do in your life, if you'll stick with the message that I gave you in the beginning, then you are the children of the promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. They were persecuting Paul in absentia because they were scared to do it in person. And they were trying to destroy his influence over the Galatian church. And the people in that church that would stick with what Paul said, he's preparing them. He said, you might as well be prepared for persecution. And anyone that follows God's true plan is going to suffer persecution. You just have to get uh, willing and used to receive it because it's going to happen. Well, you might wonder, uh, what did the Old Testament say about that? So we'll just remind you that when Isaac was born, by that time Ishmael was already a teenager, and he began to persecute Isaac. So we'll read something about that in a bit. Now, just a sidelight, uh, a lot of people think that the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt for 430 years. If you study the times involved, that's impossible. The, the 400, well, I forget whether it's the 400 or 430 right now, but <clears throat> the beginning is the persecution of Ishmael against Isaac. That's when the time frame starts. So their time in bondage down in Egypt was not nearly as long as what most people think. Anyway, here's a comment on these thoughts. You can see the condition on which you become the children of promise and receive the love of God. Jesus knew that of yourself, you could not obey God's law. Jesus knew that, but the people didn't. They said, all that you told us, that's what we'll do. You might wonder, well, why would Jesus even agree to that? And I think the answer is that he knew that some people, after trying it for a while, would say, this is not working. I'm not growing more like Jesus. I'm, I'm repeating the same old sins that I have done all my life. And I'm not advancing. And when the person wakes up that it's not working, then he says, here, I got a better one for you. Try this one. It'll work. Jesus knew that of yourself, you could not obey God's law. You know what? God doesn't even punish people who are failing because they're using their own strength. You know what he'll have to punish for? Because he offered a different plan and we didn't want it. That, that's where the punishment comes from. Not because we sin. Sin is normal and natural for human beings. And so the, the important thing for us to wake up to 
is that sin is not the problem per se. It's whether we accept the connection with Jesus or not. <clears throat> For you were sold under sin. Therefore, he came to our world to bring to you moral power that through faith in his name you might live. Notice how we live by faith in his name, not by trying harder in our own strength. <clears throat> he brings his divine power to combine with your human efforts. So the reason, the primary reason for success against sin is connecting to divine power. In fact, if you want to know, am I connected to divine power? If you fall, you weren't. If you succeed, you were. Now that should, over time, get us strong on taking hold of divine power, shouldn't it? I mean, you get reminded so often. And well, the reason I did this sin is because I didn't stay connected with divine power. So I better get back connected and stay connected. And eventually, guess what? There's a group of people that are never going to disconnect from divine power, and they're going to rise above every sin. And you could be one. In other words, God's not, he doesn't play favoritism. So you can accomplish that if you follow the right plan. <clears throat> he brings his divine power to combine with your human efforts that through his righteousness appropriated to yourself, you can keep his law. Now there's two aspects of that. I'll just mention them here. The first one is through forgiveness. Any sin we do, we can come to him and receive forgiveness. And once we've been forgiven, it's like we never sinned. So we have a perfect record in the past. The second part of it is that we take hold of his divine power and we don't sin. And whatever doesn't happen under one can happen under the other. <clears throat> but we have to be interested in both, not just one. Some people seem only interested in forgiveness. And when they sin, they ask forgiveness, but they never seek to have the power to stop sin. And this is a dangerous time to do that because the close of probation is not very far ahead. So the second part needs to get fully established in our life to where we uh, reach out for that divine power. He's always willing to give it and gain the victory over our past <clears throat> sins. Now here's <clears throat> here's the uh, text in the Old Testament. In uh, Genesis 21, 9 and 10. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had borne unto Abraham, mocking. So there's where the persecution started. <clears throat> Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. This time, God, Abraham didn't want to follow it. And God said, Abraham, listen to your wife. So that's what happened. They got cast out. In Galatians 4, 30 and 31, it says, referring to that experience, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, 
but of the free. He's giving them the benefit of the understanding, uh, trusting they're going to listen and get back uh, under the right program. But you can see here that there is a separation that is uh, commanded actually by God. And he said, don't, don't let those uh, Jewish people come in and corrupt your church. Throw them out of your church. Get rid of them. Just like uh, Abraham had to get rid of this uh, illegitimate child, in a sense. Not, not fully that way, but... So there's a, there's a lesson in that as well, which maybe we'll take a few minutes on. Here's a, a more modern example of the situation. In, uh, it says, the workers in the Nashville office have had a representation of what the human heart is capable of when it is not converted to the merciful principles of the gospel. No such spirit as has been manifested by Brother Ford should be tolerated in the work and cause of God. In other words, you should have fired uh, Brother Ford because he has a corrupting influence on the whole work where he's working. The men who labor in the office should be men who are connected with Christ and who are laborers together with God. None should be retained who are unconverted. How many? None. In the work of God, unconverted people do not belong. They are a corrupting influence. They will be even a persecuting influence because there's no harmony between converted and unconverted. And so Isaac was not to have Ishmael around to make all this trouble for him, he was to be kicked out. And the same is true in the uh, institutions that God raises up to carry on his work, which also affects the church as well. When the church has converted and unconverted people in it, it creates serious problems. And this should not be. However, uh, lest we get a Jehu stirred up to, you know, get rid of some people. If we do it, here's how we're supposed to do it. The church on earth, of Christ on earth will be imperfect. So we're not looking for perfect people. You know, that's not the question in conversion. The question is, is the person allowing God to write in their heart, God's laws more and more so that they get to be a better and better person. We don't worry where they're at right now, but where they're headed. Amen. And so uh, this is important. Otherwise, we would throw out the wrong ones. The church of Christ on earth will be imperfect, but God does not destroy his church because of its imperfection. There have been and will be those who are filled with zeal, not according to knowledge, who would purify the church and uproot the tares from the midst of the wheat. So if we're not careful, we get on our high horse and we think, well, so-and-so, they're a problem in the church. We need to get rid of them. And this one we need to get rid of. And this is not the way. But Christ has given special light as to how to deal with those who are erring and with those who are unconverted in the church. And I didn't put it in here because the sermon was getting long enough. <coughs> but if you read in Matthew 18, there's three steps of how we're supposed to deal with people that are doing what they shouldn't do. And the first step is we talk to them because they may choose to change. Then if they don't listen to the one person, we take some others with us and talk to them. And finally, it gets considered by the whole church. And if they don't listen to the whole church, 
then that's the time we uh, put them out because it indicates they're not converted. If they won't accept correction, that's a sign of lack of conversion. Um, there is to be no spasmodic, zealous, hasty action taken by church members in cutting off those they may think defective in character. Tares will appear among the wheat, but it would do more harm to weed out the tares unless in God's appointed way. Now, there's two ditches, there always is. On one side, people say, well, I'll just let the wheat and the tares grow together. God said they'll be there. The other one says, let's get them out. You know, all those bad guys, let's get them out. And God says, no. Some people need to go out, but it needs to be in God's appointed way, which is the Matthew 18 uh, principle. Unless in God's appointed way, then to leave them alone. In other words, if you just leave them there, it's going to create great harm. Well, Paul was speaking in a very crisis situation and saying, you need to get those people out of the church. In uh, the last few minutes, we'll cover just a, a beginning of chapter 5. Verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, <clears throat> Satan has been able to confuse people about what is liberty. And he, he likes to do it with teenagers. And as they get into the teenage years, they start thinking, wow, I can't wait till I get out of this home and I can do what I want to do and I can not have these restrictions upon me. And they look upon that as liberty. Well, that's one thing. They're teenagers. But adults look at it the same way. They think liberty is to do whatever they want to do. If we understand this text, Paul is saying, no, that's not true. That's the pathway to slavery. Because our human heart likes the bad things. Our human heart craves the things that are not good for us or not even good for others. And once you get into that, you become a slave. I'm sure some of you here were slaves to tobacco. And maybe when you started smoking, you thought, you know, I got freedom finally, I can smoke. But you soon discover, if you ever come to where you want to stop, that you're a slave. And so Satan turns things around and gets us to think that we have liberty when really we have a slavery. And so Paul is trying to wake them up and say, you know what? The path that you're on is going to lead you to slavery. Take back that liberty that you had before, which arises from obedience. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Jesus has our best interest involved. And when he tells us not to do something, it's not an arbitrary requirement. He's basically saying to us, I know what will happen to you if you keep doing this, so I want to help you stop it. Will you let me help you stop it so that you don't become a slave to, to these things? And the person says, no, I want my liberty. See, because they have the wrong idea of liberty. And then he comes back and says, and be not entangled again with the yoke of of bondage. Now that one really gets misunderstood as well. And the Ten Commandments are called a yoke of bondage. But the, that does not fit a careful study of the Bible. And I don't have a full study here. 
on it, but I think you can see from my description of liberty that the Ten Commandments are really uh, liberty giving. <laughs> they produce liberty to live in a way that's beneficial to you and to other people. You know, addictions are not only bad for us, but they're bad for those around us as well. It, it brings harm to everybody. We can see that, you know, with certain addictions very easily, can't we? But other addictions are harder for us to see. Now here are some of the things that when we connect with Christ, which means we're going to let him write the Ten Commandments in our heart, what are some of the freedoms that we get? Well, one that's really precious is freedom from guilt. You know, a person that is 